Well, that's a great Sunday night crowd. We appreciate all of you uh, coming back. And uh, we are excited about tonight. This is the crescendo. This is the end. But it's not the end of revival. This is a missions revival. It's sure not the end of revival. So praise the Lord. I trust a lot of things are just beginning in your heart and life. And we are just thankful for the invitation to be here. Pastor Umber, we appreciate that so very much. And we conclude now this seventh time together. May God bless us in the future. And we are looking forward to what he's going to do here. I appreciate the church. I appreciate your music. I appreciate the balance of your music. And I appreciate that you have a, uh, a good balance of hymns and contemporary things, but all done in good taste, all done not as the world's people would do it. You know, there are many people that have infiltrated, uh, many worldly things have infiltrated the church, and I'm glad that you can uh, say praise God for a holy church. And, and we've always loved this church. It's always been a special place, even when I was pastor of First Baptist Church in Pasco, Washington, and we'd come up here for your April conference, and then been coming now as an evangelist these years. And uh, we appreciate Pastor Umber, we appreciate Pastor Flippo! Appreciate all of you, our hosts and hostess this week. Again, thank you. Thank you for uh, entertaining us there. And uh, be praying for us as we leave tomorrow, heading for White, South Dakota. We'll be starting a meeting there a week from today. They're right on the Minnesota border. And then have that full week of meetings there. And then go on to Norfolk, Virginia. I preach a youth rally. All-nighter. Where's Brother Flippo? i got to send him in my place. All-nighter. Coming up next Friday night. And i got to preach twice in that all-nighter. And then Sunday through Friday meetings. And then on to Kansas City. Uh, they're playing Green Bay today. What can I say? And so... Uh I grew up in Wisconsin. All right, so uh, we were have those meetings in Kansas City and then on to Colorado to uh, have Thanksgiving with our son, Jonathan, and his fiance and his fiance's family. And we appreciate that family. We've known the Edwards family. Jonathan is marrying in December a gal named Megan Edwards. Her father was major. Uh, ben Edwards, U.S. Air Force. You know what I mean. And so... <laughs> But Major Edwards, stationed in Guam, and we had meetings in Guam, and uh, Jonathan and Megan used to play together at seven and eight years old, and then again later when we had meetings in Guam again while they were there, and then, uh, and then Brother Ben Edwards uh, retired from the Air Force, went to seminary, then deputation, and now he's a missionary to the military in Japan, in, in Japan, and so uh, been a great thing to, ha to know the family, and so appreciate your prayers for Jonathan. And we have that Thanksgiving with them, and then the wedding in December. All right, we uh, want to give you something here. Uh, not everything is as it appears. You, you've, got to, you've got to recognize things that aren't of God. We've got to have discernment. Uh, the devil is a great counterfeiter. But these things are interesting, and I'm wondering how many of these things you can answer, all right? How long did the Hundred Years' War last? A hundred and sixteen years. Which country makes Panama hats? <laughs> Ecuador. From which animal do we get cat gut? All right, well, sheep and horses, of course, everybody knows that. In which, all right, are you ready? This is, this is for you guys back there. In which month do Russians celebrate the October Revolution? <laughs> Igor, November. <laughs> November. Come on. Why wouldn't you worship? Why, would, why wouldn't you celebrate the October Revolution in November? Now everybody knows that. You don't do that anymore, hey? This must be pretty old. When did I get this? Uh, uh, what is a camel's hairbrush made of? Squirrel, the Canary Islands in the Pacific are named for what animal? Dogs. <laughs> what was King George the Sixth first name? <laughs> Albert. <laughs> what color is a purple finch? Red. Okay. Where are Chinese gooseberries from? <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> 
Not everything is as it appears. What is the color of the black box in a commercial airliner? Our orange, right? Is that what you said? Naval orange, is that what you said? All right, well, hey, you got one. That's good, John. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> well, let's be discerning and let's know truth. And let's have Grace come up and do a sacred recitation. This is her final one for this series. I appreciate her uh, ministry. Not everybody has this ministry called sacred recitation. Maybe you young, some of you young ones can, can, can pick this up and, and, and get this as a, as a talent and a ministry. So let's listen. Drunkards transformed. The lights of hope put back in the eyes of a hopeless child. I've seen a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious with fever. And I've watched that little body grow quiet as the fevered brow cooled. I've sat beside a dying saint. Her body racked with pain who in her final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, the name of Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophers have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it. Oh, yet it still stands, the name of Jesus. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. For in that day, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you see, my friends, it was not mere chance that made an angel one night long ago say to a virgin maiden, his name shall be called Jesus. Jesus. There is something about that name. Amen. Thank you, Grace. There certainly is. So let's pray in that name, Father in heaven. Glad that we can come before your presence again. I'm glad this is a praying church, a praying pastor. Lord, we do come to you in the matchless, marvelous name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We invoke your blessing. We welcome you to our service. Would you come down and just meet with us now through your word and just meet every spiritual need that's here tonight. Help us, Lord, as our focus and heart is on missions today. And Lord, we are excited about the results we've already heard concerning the commitment cards. And I know more are coming in. And I pray it would be the greatest year for giving for this church. So bless, bless, bless. And we come to you now and ask your anointing upon the preach word of God in Christ's name. Amen. We are returning to Acts chapter 8 where we began on Thursday evening. Many of you were with us Thursday evening, but many of you were not. So we give a really brief recap. The Lord is using a man called Philip the Evangelist. He did not have the same prejudices being a Grecian Jew that the Jews of Judea who become believers had. And so the Lord Jesus wanted the, wanted the Samaritans reached, missions to the despised, missions to a, a, a group of people of ethnicity that no one else wanted to reach. But Philip the evangelist goes to Samaria 
He has a wonderful, wonderful ministry there. Great results. Spirit of God's moving. Souls being saved, baptized. Churches being established. And then God has a change in the ministry for Philip. There in verse 26 where we had the first of three C's. C's in our outline if you're taking notes. The command. The command comes to Philip by an angel. In verse 26 of Acts 8. And the angel of the Lord spake to Philip saying arise and go. That's a great mission statement right there. Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza which is desert. So the Lord comes through an angelic being. You must leave Samaria. Your ministry here is now finished. You're going to travel now some two days journey south to a Roman road connecting Jerusalem with Gaza. And there is one man God wants you to reach. So you're going to leave the multitudes where you've had such a fruitful numeric ministry. And now you're going to go down there and reach one man. And Philip is a great God call preacher as I was preaching and reminding the pastors when we had a pastor's fellowship this past Friday morning, you know you're called to preach when you're as willing to preach to one as you are to a whole room full of people. And so he goes down and we're introduced to this man of ancient Nubia, Ethiopia, a great man of authority, treasure of his nation. And he comes to Jerusalem for to worship. He's seeking a relationship with the one true and living God. Doesn't know how to get it. The living God has a temple in Jerusalem. So he makes his way to Jerusalem to find his, the answers to his questions, the solution to his problems, how to worship this living God, how to have a relationship with him. But verse 28 said he was returning. He's returning. He's going home lost. He's going home unsaved, unfulfilled, unsatisfied, unprepared, undeserving, un, un, un. He didn't find his answers in Jerusalem because he was looking in the wrong place. You don't seek a relationship with the living God through a religious system or religious rituals or enterprise and he is disappointed, he's going home and he has a a, a, a scroll of the book of Isaiah, the prophet, in verse 28. He's reading that. Now the Spirit of God comes to Philip in verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. The angel in verse 26, the Holy Spirit in verse 29. Here's the object of God's grace. Here's the command of God. Go talk to this man. Join yourself to this chariot. And that's where we ended on Thursday night with the challenge that do we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit say that to us when's the last time you know you know the Spirit of God spoke to your heart and directed you to witness maybe it was at work neighborhood guy raking the leaves woman on the porch whatever it is you knew the Spirit of God was commanding you to reach or at least present the gospel or a gospel track or something and we, and we said that, that 1 Thessalonians 20, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 5, 20, uh, 19, uh, sorry, uh, quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. But I'm afraid so many times we quench the Spirit that He doesn't speak to us anymore. That we have quenched Him and quenched Him and quenched Him. We, we, we've had command the, the, the Spirit of God to, to witness to someone and we said no, we gave some excuse and so now we're not even sensitive to his voice and I actually ended with my testimony because there was a, a Navy man, how's that, Navy? Well, Navy, <laughs> Navy man, Mark Cheney took the Navy to get the job done but uh, a Navy man was directed by the Spirit of God to come and witness to me. And that was his testimony. The Spirit of God said, join yourself to that lost airman there in the back of the Maranatha Baptist Church in Okinawa, Japan, while I was serving in the Air Force. That was September 19th, 1976. My drinking buddy got saved and begged me, invited me to come watch his believer's baptism. And so I went that night as a Roman Catholic to a Baptist church. And for the first time in my life, 
I heard the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, the Lord Jesus arrested me and accosted me and conquered my sinful heart that night as I called on him to save my poor, wretched, hell-bound soul. And I was radically, dramatically saved. A week later, baptized. Two months later, called to preach. Been preaching ever since. But one man was directed by the Spirit of God to come and witness to me. You never know. You never know what's going to happen in that life you witness to. And so, now we pick it up. The account where we left off. And so here we are in, in verse 30 as we come to our second C, which is the contact. First we receive a command and then the contact with this object of God's grace and love. And Philip ran thither to him, to this Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And so the Spirit of God says, go join yourself to the chariot. So he does. He ran toward this man. How many of us run in the opposite direction of a witnessing opportunity? But this man, Philip, he runs to that chariot. Can you see him trotting alongside? The, uh, excuse me, sir, there. Uh, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> I notice you're reading, and he was reading out loud from Isaiah chapter 53. Do you understand what you're reading? And then this eunuch almost answers with 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, and neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. He said, how can I? What do you mean, can I understand? Understand is what thou readest. And he said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. Oh, my word, that's, that's full of richness, isn't it? Unsaved people cannot understand God's truth. That's what the Bible says. It's just like this room right now. This room is filled with radio waves. Did you know that? Radio waves are bouncing all over this room right now. Can you hear the music? Can you get the weather report? Can you get the Sunday night football game? <laughs> no, because you don't have a receiver. It's right in this room. Stops bouncing all over, but you cannot understand it until you have a receiver. And if you had a receiver, we could tune that in and get the music or the weather or the news or whatever. See, unsaved people don't have the receiver. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is bouncing all over the place, all over this country. But unsaved people cannot understand it. They are darkened in their understanding. They are blinded to God's truth. For the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's the way I was for 20 years. Roman Catholic, religious, but absolutely ignorant of the word of God. I had no clue whatsoever that I needed to be saved or born again. And my, when you... When you get saved, it, it is just like with the Apostle Paul there. The scales come off of your eyes. And now you have this understanding that we never had before. But that understanding is not going to come unless somebody guides sinners to the truth. How can I understand this except someone guides me? That's missions. That's all of us. Are you willing to be a guide to those that cannot understand spiritual truth? Unless you share that with them, they'll never understand it. Does it, has it ever gripped your mind, your heart, that we possess a message that can change the eternal destiny of people? We must share it. Yes, it's true, they must believe it and receive it. But they'll never believe it and receive it unless we share it. <laughs> and so are we willing to be guides? And then look what this eunuch says, what he does in verse 31. And he, the Ethiopian eunuch, desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. This word desired is a very, very strong word. It literally means... 
It literally means that the eunuch begged Philip. He desired, he begged him to come up in the chariot with him and help him understand God's truth. Now when the Spirit of God is working, this is how it goes. And I, I know you'll be surprised when I tell you as an evangelist that, that I believe this. I, I have pattered a lot of my ministry in philosophy of evangelism from Acts chapter 8. And you notice I don't give real long invitations. We're not going to sing 50 stanzas of just as I am. <laughs> I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not going to resort to carnal means to get people to respond. Uh, I don't need the notches in my belt. I, I believe after 26 years as an evangelist and 14 years of pastoring, uh, I, I don't need the notches. <laughs> I, don't, I don't fill my reports with glowing statistics. <laughs> I really don't, because I believe this. When the Spirit of God is working, He's going to do the work. It's not my oratorical skills. It's not my persuasive ability that's going to get the job done. When the Spirit of God is working, it's the sinner desiring the evangelist to help him. It's not me begging, please, please come forward. I tell you, there's some evangelists, their whole thing is ego. Their whole thing is statistical pride. Their whole ministry is wrapped around how many people come forward. <laughs> They're going to get somebody up there. Have you ever noticed those kind of guys? They're going to get somebody up there. <laughs> And they'll resort to general things. You want to serve the Lord? Come forward. Well, who doesn't want to serve the Lord? I mean, don't we all here want to serve the Lord? <laughs> and then they'll say, if you promise not to shoot your mother, please come forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little extreme. But, but you know, when the Spirit of God is working, and, I, and, I, and I've seen this enough that I, I believe it, I was in Constantia Center, New York, Upper New York State, Finger Lakes area, if you know that area of New York. And I was preaching away and never even got to the invitation, but an 18-year-old Roman Catholic girl named Rebecca shot up out of her seat and she cried out, I'm lost! I'm going to hell! I need to be saved. And she mowed everybody out of her row like a lawnmower. And she came running up to the front trembling like the Philippian jailer of old. And when that happened, the Spirit of God fell on that place. And people started getting up, coming forward. People getting saved. I, I just stand back and watch it. I just get out of the way. Didn't really even get to finish my message. Same thing happened in Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, islands of the Caribbean. Now, I was preaching on the great white throne judgment. <laughs> Revelation 20, 11 through 15, man, I was getting into that message. I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away and there's found no place for them, certainly no place to escape. Nowhere to hide. Now you can hide behind a religious system. You can hide behind an occupation. You can hide behind a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You can hide behind a hundred different excuses today. But in that day, there's nowhere to hide. Nowhere to escape. No place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. I mean, I'm getting into it. <laughs> I didn't get very far, and a Trinidadian lady shot up, I'm lost, I need to be saved, and she came forward, and people right and left all over the place are coming forward for salvation. I got about halfway through my message. Number one, it's not about me, is it? <laughs> I'm just a nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. <laughs> But it's the Spirit of God that falls on a place. It's the Spirit of God that convicts of sin, Amen. convinces as to who Christ is. And I like your third C this morning, compels you 
to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Is there a place for knowing the terror of the Lord we persuade? Man, yes, there's a place for that. But basically, as we see from this text, it was the sinner begging the evangelist, help me understand this. So if there's any need in this room tonight, don't make me beg you. You just come and say, God is leading me by His Spirit to come and get saved or rededicate my life or whatever. And so here he is in the chariot sharing with him. And the place of the scripture, verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. It's Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. End of quote. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? And the eunuch is asking Philip the evangelist, now, who, who was led like a sheep to the slaughter? Whose life was taken from the earth? Is Isaiah talking about himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth. Verse 35, underline it. <laughs> Philip opened his mouth. We've got to open our mouths. <laughs> All witness begins with communication. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Oh, you know Isaiah 53 written 700 years before Christ ever left the glories of heaven and took on a human body and came crashing into human history, walking on the earth he created, going to the cross and allowing his own creation, man to nail him there. And he died and poured out his life's blood for our redemption and rose again from the dead. Isaiah 53, amazing chapter, 12 verses. It was the main chapter of the Old Testament that was used in the first century to lead hundreds, yea, thousands to Christ. It has been effective all these years. In fact, in synagogues today, in the Shabbat reading, every Saturday they read out of the Torah and the Tanakh, they uh, skip over Isaiah 53. The rabbi, he'll read 52, skip right over 53 and go to 54. Now, if I'm a Jew in a synagogue and my rabbi does that, that would, that would bring great curiosity to my mind. Why is he skipping Isaiah 53? It'd make me want to read it even more. But uh, they fear that chapter because it's so potent. 700 years before Christ comes, there's a detailed account of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and everything you need to know to get saved is in Isaiah 53. And so that's what this eunuch is reading. That's what Philip expounds to him. Verse 36, we come now to the conversion. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. The neat thing about that road from Rome, <laughs> from Jerusalem to Gaza, a Roman road, uh, over 2,000 years old, it's still there. Not, not the entire road, but parts of it are still there. You can stand on it. I host tours to Israel uh, every year, every other year. Join me on one of my trips, would you please? But uh, we, we, there's only one place on that whole Roman road with enough water that you could possibly baptize somebody. And so they come on their way and they come into a certain water. Now many people are at this water station because it's a long way between Jerusalem and Gaza, and so this is the place to refill your water containers. And certainly the, the Ethiopian eunuch, and remember we talked about a man of his rank and stature would never travel alone from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem, so he had a caravan with servants and soldiers, and many people with him that made the journey to Jerusalem and now returning to uh, ancient Ethiopia, and so those people are there uh, refilling their water containers. Many others are there. It was a very public place. So they came unto that certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? My first question is, how does he know about Christian baptism? 
Did he see a group of Christians in, in Jerusalem? Or when Philip shared with him the gospel of the Lord Jesus from Isaiah 53, did he go on to teach him about a public identification with Christ in baptism? This representation of the death, burial, and, and, and resurrection of Christ, well, we don't know, but he does know about it. And he asks a point-blank question. And I'm glad he did, because if there's ever a place in the scripture where we're going to get the scriptural answer, it's going to be here. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Who can be baptized? What's the prerequisite for baptism? What about baptism? Who? Who? I like point blank questions. I like them in the Bible. I like the one in Acts 16.30 where the Philippian jailer says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, you're going to get an answer to that point blank question that should solve a lot of theological debate. There's nothing to debate. There, there, there should be no confusion. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, Amen. was Paul's answer. Pretty simple. Totally empty of religious trappings and rituals and laws and sacraments and everything else. <laughs> believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Now the key is in the word believe, the Bible word believe. It's the Greek word pistuo from the root word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. <laughs> It means to place your faith, your trust, your dependency for eternal life in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Did you get it? Amen. Place your faith, your trust, your dependency for eternal life in Jesus Christ and Him alone. That's what's going to save you, your faith in Christ. And so the eunuch asks the question, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip answers in verse 37. If thou believest, there's that word again. Amen. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Again, believe. What does the Bible word believe mean again? It means to place your faith, your trust, your dependency for eternal life in Jesus Christ and him alone. And Philip tells the eunuch, you want to be baptized? You must place your faith, your trust, your dependency for eternal life in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Uh, th this is called repetition for effect. <laughs> and so he answers and he says, I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. I do place my faith, my trust, and dependency for eternal life in Jesus Christ. I believe that He is deity. I believe He's the Savior. I believe that He's the Son of God. That's His profession of faith. Now we could talk about sinner's prayer. When somebody is saved, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't give a formula prayer, does it? Because it's faith. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. I get very disturbed when I ask somebody, how do you, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? If I were to ask you that question, how do you know you're saved? So I, I prayed a prayer. Red flags go waving. It's not praying a prayer that saves your soul. It's faith in Christ. Trust in His finished work. Depending upon Him and Him alone for eternal life. Amen. This is his profession of faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's it. That's his conversion. Maybe the words you said when you got saved were different than these. But did you place your faith, your trust, and dependency for eternal life in Jesus Christ? Did you? All right, three of you did. See, it's not the prayer. I, 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 people I've led to the Lord... Sometimes came in, did, did, I, did I say the right words? 
There's not any wrong words. Did you place your faith? Should I go through it again? <laughs> That's the issue. Your faith in the person and finished work of Christ on the cross on behalf of you. Rising again. Embracing. Receiving. Believing. Appropriating. Internalizing. The risen Christ. It's not the prayer per se. The, the prayer. Let me illustrate this. This is my famous milkshake illustration. I got a big, tall, chocolatey milkshake. And I have one goal. My goal is to get the contents of that glass into my stomach via the taste buds. That's my goal. Now how am I going to reach that goal? I'm going to use a straw. I'm going to use a straw. I'm not going to eat the straw. The straw is only the means by which I get the contents of the glass internalized into my stomach. And that's the prayer, all right? If you want to say, sinner's prayer. All right, that's the straw. You don't trust the prayer. I pray to prayer. That means you're trusting in your prayer, not in Christ. Prayer is the straw. Prayer is the means by which you receive Christ into your heart by faith. So verse 37 is very important verse. In fact, it's so important, that's why the modern translations delete it. That's right. That's right. You won't find this in the modern English translations. Verse 37 is gone. Why is it gone? Because it's not in the Alexandrian text. As I said, it's a textual issue. Whole sections of the New Testament are missing in the Alexandrian text. Versus what we call the received text or the... Uh, majority text or the Syrian text, the Byzantine text, it's called a lot of things, but there's two families of manuscripts and they differ in 30,000 places. They cannot both be the preserved Word of God to every generation. So the King James is the only one translated from what we believe are the proper manuscripts. And all the other ones, this verse 37 is missing and how, how, how victorious was the devil in taking out verse 37. No wonder there's confusion in these contemporary churches that use modern translations. Because this verse is cardinal in our understanding of what we call believer's baptism. If you believe with all your heart. So why are churches baptizing babies? Can a baby believe with all his or her heart? No! And why are we having sprinkling and all these things? This passage answers any debate on what is believer's baptism and who can be baptized, and you believe with all your heart. Amen. If you believe in the gospel with a mental assent or with your head, your life is not changing. Your life changes when you believe on Christ from the depths of your heart and soul, and you are dramatically, radically converted and saved and born again. Verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water. Enough water for immersion. Both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. Baptism is a public identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an outward expression of something that's already happened inside of you in an inward transformation, the new birth publicly identifying with Jesus Christ. There were many people at that watering place. Again, a whole caravan full of servants and soldiers that were with the eunuch that traveled with him. Many others are at this public place filling up their water containers. Baptism is a public identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism is a command of Scripture. It is not a suggestion. It is not an option. Any true born-again believer that is now filled with the Holy Spirit will go through the waters of believer's baptism. Why? Because Romans 8.14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. When the Spirit of God comes within you, He will convict you. He will lead you into the waters of believer's baptism. So if, you've been, if you're here tonight and you have been saved, you're born again, but you've not yet followed in believer's baptism, tonight is your night to present yourself as a candidate for baptism. Amen. When the invitation comes, you're going to be one of the first ones up here. 
Because it's a command of Scripture, and you'll never have the full blessing of God in your life until you make this step of obedience in believer's baptism. I get very concerned about people who have made professions of faith years ago and followed in believer's baptism. To realize all that time you've not had the full blessing of God in your life. And you can't until you obey the scripture. The spirit of God is going to lead you. And so a public identification. Jesus Christ wants this. He, he's, he taught us about baptism. In fact, he said in Matthew 10.32... If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. You see, baptism, a scriptural baptism by immersion, identifying with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, is your public confession. Christ wants you to publicly declare that you are a saved disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you fully intend to walk in the newness of this life, Romans 6, 4. I was a pastor for many years. I baptized a lot of people in my ministry and I, would, I had a baptism class with everybody I baptized. Because when I got baptized at Maranatha Baptist Church in Okinawa, Japan, to be honest, nobody instructed me about what it was. Now they said, you're a believer. Obedience step is baptism. Uh, next Sunday night, I said, yes, next Sunday night, I'll be glad to do it. But nobody explained to me what it was. I was glad to do it because the Spirit of God is in me leading me to do that. But I really would have appreciated it if someone sat down with me and showed me the scripture on why this baptism is important and what it actually represents. And way back those yonder years ago, I said, well, if I'm ever a pastor, I'm going to make sure that the people I baptize understand what they're doing. And I, 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 I have been true to that, to that uh, commitment. And, and I do put the fear of God in them. Because baptism is a public identification with Jesus Christ as death, burial, resurrection. Here's who saved me. Jesus died for me, rose again. And furthermore, I died with him. I was buried with him. I was risen with him to walk in newness of life. I said, don't you dare stand in that baptistry with all those people watching and lie. <laughs> Don't you ever tell a lie to those people. You are declaring to them that I fully intend to walk in the newness of this life. If I got to come and find you six months from now, something's wrong. <laughs> Don't lie to those people. Are you ready for baptism? Yes, sir. <laughs> as far as, well, we, we kept most of those we baptized. But... Uh, What's public identification? Have you ever been on a, on a freeway and you're driving along thinking everything's great and then you look in your rearview mirror and there are flashing blue and red lights? Was there any question in your mind who that was? Public identification. Policemen are very, very publicly identified with their vehicle and its flashing lights in your rearview mirror and then they get out and their uniform guy gets a, hey, do you know why I pulled you over? Say, so how do you know that? Because I've been pulled over, right? <laughs> you can't drive all the hundreds of thousands of miles we drive and not get pulled over sometime. Well, they're publicly identified. You see a fireman, fire trucks, publicly identified. My son is Army. Is that all right or not? Army. He loves the Army. I try to get him to go blue, Brother George. I say, go blue. He said, no, green. <laughs> You know, he started enlisted. He went to boot camp because he joined the Army Reserve. Uh, he loves the weaponry. And he loves things that go boom. <laughs> he calls us from basic training. Dad, you'll never believe it. They pay me to throw hand grenades. I said, <laughs> That's what he said. I said, well, son, I, I'm glad you're having a good time. You know, just... <laughs> And then he says, how, how many hand grenades did you, did you throw in Air Force? I went, well, well, none. <laughs> how many times did you fire the M16? Well, well, I think it was once. Uh, <laughs> he calls it the U.S. Chair Force. He, said, uh, he, he says Air Force, Air Force people do push-ups. They lay on their back and they go like this. You know, they... <laughs> That's my beloved son right there. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, now he's, now he's an officer cadet. He's an ROTC. He's got one more year before he's commissioned as a second lieutenant. Amen. And so we're pleased with him. Uh, he 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 is always wanted to be an army officer. So he'll begin his army officer career. He's already a cadet. Uh, he, he goes to army reserve. He already outranks all the enlisted people. And he's a officer cadet. And he's a he's a he's a good good soldier. And he looks forward to that leadership. But he's publicly identified. Most of the time I see him, he's in uniform. Everybody knows this is an army soldier. And so public identification. I am publicly identified tonight. Can you tell me why? What do you see about me that is public identification? Anybody know? I have a microphone. Well, <laughs> that's true. But it's this ring on my hand. Do you realize that publicly identifies me? What does that tell all of the other women? You're married and you're already taken. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a young guy, you know, I, I, I see a girl, a, a, a bonita, a chica, you know, and I, uh, I, the first thing I do is look at her hand. Amen. You guys, I, was I out in left field or did you do that? First thing I do, look at their hands, see if there's a ring on there. If they're not, hot dog, she's available. <laughs> and so the ring is a symbol the ring is a public identification. I belong to somebody and somebody belongs to me. I belong to that lady in the blue dress <laughs> for 40 years. Amen. This ring has been on my hand for 40 years. In fact, I cannot get it off. <laughs> I cannot. I'm glad it still twirls so I don't have to have it cut off. But my son, boy, I tell you, all the years growing up, Dad, I'll get that ring off. <laughs> <laughs> just about kill me is not coming off. The ring ceremony always follows the vows. As a pastor, I perform many, many weddings. The vows before God and witnesses are what marries you. Your vows marry you. And so keep your vows, married people. <laughs> God says in Ecclesiastes 5.5, 5, if you make vows before God and break them, he says you're a fool. Forgive me if that hit somebody. We make vows before God and these witnesses to love, cherish, sickness, health, for rich or for poor, until death do us part. Oh boy. And those vows, you're married in God's sight. And now we have the ring ceremony. Now the ring ceremony. Exchanging rings, which are a public identification of those vows. Isn't that just like salvation? When you get saved, it's like a wedding. Do you take the Lord Jesus as your lawfully wedded Savior and Lord? I do. Do you, Lord Jesus, take this old dirty rotten sinner that you died for, shed your blood for, and rose again? Do you take him as your child? I do! And you're saved. Amen. Then comes the baptism, which is like the ring in a marriage. And you publicly identify with the Lord Jesus and you tell everyone out that I belong to the Lord Jesus. He belongs to me forever. I'm already taken. The devil can't have me. The flesh, the world, sin can't have me. I belong to the Lord Jesus. He alone has me. And I have him. Good and so this dear eunuch is saved. He's baptized and publicly identifies with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 39, when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he, the eunuch, went on his way rejoicing. There's three ways... Three ways you can leave here rejoicing. Number one, get saved if you're not saved. I guarantee, oh, you get saved tonight, you'll be leaving this place rejoicing with sins forgiven. Amen. The guilt lifted, a home in heaven awaiting you, reserved in heaven for you. Get saved, you'll leave here rejoicing. Number two, if you've been saved but you've never followed in believer's baptism. Maybe you're six, maybe you're 16, maybe you're 60. Whoever you might be, would you obey the command to follow the Lord in believer's baptism? 
and you can come as we have a pianist that's going to come and play for us and, and you can just come, Pastor Umber will be here and you can take him by the hand and say, I'd like to be baptized and, and we will schedule you, right? We'll schedule you for a baptism. Is this it right here? All right. Would you be willing? Would you be obedient? And you come tonight and say, I'd like to be scripturally baptized. I want to publicly identify with Christ. You leave here rejoicing in your obedience. And then all of us who've been saved and baptized, we can leave rejoicing with a decision to, to be like Philip, to follow the voice of the Spirit of God and be a witness and a testimony and a missionary for the Lord Jesus. There is no greater joy in the Christian life than leading another soul to Jesus Christ. The sad truth, there are many believers who have never experienced that joy. There are many who don't at least even try to present the gospel to unsaved people. And if you make a commitment to be a missionary every day, to take opportunities every day that the Spirit of God gives you and become sensitive to the Holy Spirit and available to the Lord, be a witness for Him, you make that decision tonight, you leave here rejoicing. Well.